ever and ever and ever. Praise the Lord, church. If God has done anything for you, can we give him a hand clap of praise? He's worthy for his mercy endures forever. I'm happy, y'all. I um, am coming to you with our announcements um, to Pastor Robinson and Sister Robinson in their absence. Uh, just a couple of announcements for you. We want to first give congratulations to Michaela Russell. His mercy endures forever. Michaela will be uh, graduating, who graduated, who has already graduated. I'm already ready for the celebration down in the box. Michaela graduated with her bachelor's in social work from Mississippi Valley State University. She graduated on Tuesday, November 22nd, 2021, again with her bachelor's in social work. Her open house will be Saturday, December 4th, from 3 to 7 p.m. Again, Saturday, December 4th, from 3 to 7 p.m. Please see Michaela or her mother, Tanya, for specific details. Michaela will be attending grad school in the fall of 2022. Wow. you all so please continue to keep her in prayer be praying with her as she continues to look at other options as far as choosing the best school for her to further her education in um, her educational journey amen okay we are so so very proud of you thank you thank you all um, the second announcement is just a reminder we are in the holiday season so as we come to the church uh, the security team has asked that we Remind everyone to keep your personal items out of sight, keep them locked in your glove compartment or in your trunk. Um, again, we don't want anyone to be looking into your car and trying to remove your items. Also ensure your vehicles are locked at all times, again, to prevent anyone from trying to get in. So those are the only announcements that Pastor has left for us. Let us continue to worship and praise God with our praise team, Renewed Faith.
because of me, it's not because of who I am, but it's simply because of whom God is. So if you have your Bibles, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, the true and ever living God. I don't know what God you come serving this morning, but I'm talking about the God that never sleeps nor slumbers. I'm talking about the God that exists outside of time, was before, before, and will be after, after that God is worthy. So if you have your Bibles, come with me to Luke, the 15th chapter. And when you get there, say amen. amen. Luke 15, and I'm going to start at verse number one. It says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, him being Jesus, to hear him 
And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, Now let's, let's come down, let's come down to the 11th verse. When you get there, say, I'm happy. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he being the father divided to them his being the father's livelihood. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possession with prodigality. And when he had spent all, I'm gonna stop right there, when and when he had spent all. We're going to, we're going to deal with the entirety of the text, but, but that, that's a good point to stop reading. Because I, I find that certain scriptures, if you keep scratching on it, there's a reaction that happens. And so as I kept studying and, and scratching right there, and when kept shouting me in my house. So let's get back, let's get back to the top of the verse. Because you may not shout about the same things that I shout about. Uh, the history of the book Luke we all know it's written by the great physician himself. Uh, and Luke wants to give a chronological, meticulous account of the ultimate leader and perfect savior who is Jesus. That's all the history you're going to get in verse 1. I told you we're going quick today. In verse 1, the Pharisees and the scribes are murmuring against Jesus because he's willing to show kindness and tenderness and love to the very sinners and tax collectors and others that these Pharisees and scribes have judged and condemned as not worthy. Jesus, in the text, is entertaining the lesser than crowd. Uh, those who were looked down on by those who had a little bit that were well to do, those who had a little money in the bank, those who had positions of authority, and so those who sat high seemingly looked down on those who didn't have. Uh, they surmised amongst themselves that if Jesus is so eager and willing to accept and dwell with what they consider to be the lowest among us, he cannot be the high priest that he claims he is. For certainly a high priest would know who these people are. A high priest would know where these people come from. A high priest would know what these people do on a routine basis. And no high priest that I want to serve would sully himself by allowing these type of folk to hang around him. Can I put a pin in that right now? Because I'm so glad that Jesus set the precedent way back then that he's not too good to dwell with the lowest of us. Because I don't know about you, but I was not born into money. I grew up in the ghetto on the east side of Indianapolis called Brightwood. So you wouldn't have found me in the synagogue with the Pharisees and scribes, but I'm so glad that Jesus was not too good to come down on 25th and Adams in between Sherman and Keystone. I'm so glad that Jesus was not too good to stroll down 33rd off of Clifton. I'm so glad. 
And if we're told the truth, well, yeah, some of us put on our suits. And we play dress up and we cover up what we don't want nobody else to see. But if we're told the truth, some of us would be very glad that Jesus strolled down through the ghettos and gutters. That Jesus associated with the dope addicts. That Jesus associated with those who were viewed as less than. Because we ain't going to know how we look today. We ain't always had it together. If I got two or three honest people, say amen. amen. They would have realized that Jesus did not mingle with sinful people because he wanted to partake in the sin. They would have realized that Jesus mingled with them not to sin, but to sin. They would have realized that Jesus went out not to reject, but to redeem. They would have realized that Jesus hung out with them not to ridicule, but to restore. They would have realized that Jesus hung out with them not to excommunicate, but to equip. And I'm so glad that he set it up me and it said, it's my grace. Are you saved? Yeah, I, I, I know, I know, I know you're from a royal bloodline. I know all of your family has worked in the church. I know your daddy was the pastor. And I know your mother was the chair of the motherboard. I, I know that you've been on the junior usher board and now the senior usher board. I know that you served in the choir. Somebody gonna pick it up in a minute. And I know you got all of these church titles, but I'm so glad. And he said it's by grace. It's not your title as president of the usher board. No, no, it's, it's not your title as chair of the trustees. But it's by grace. The first page is done, the sermon's a third over. Let's get down to the text. The young son is the focus of the second parable. This book of Luke has been referred to as the lost book. Why is that? Because Jesus teaches three parables. One about a lost coin, one about a lost sheep, and one about the lost son. The sheep got lost naturally. The coin was lost accidentally. And the son chose to go be lost, but in every situation, somebody went looking to find it. Can I put that shoe on you this morning? It don't matter whether you got lost naturally. Don't matter whether you got lost accidentally on your way somewhere else. Because I know you didn't mean to sin. You didn't leave the house looking to go sin. That was just me when I was younger. Or it don't matter if you want to admit, like the son, you thought that when you was grown enough to go do what you wanted to do, that you could just go ahead and do it, and you ended up lost. However you got lost, can I tell you that on this morning, there's a remedy for your situation. The young man in the text failed to do a few things. And we're going to get to him and be out of here. The first thing the young man in the text failed to do was recognize the divine providence that rested on his father's house. Divine providence that rested on his father's house. I hear you say, preacher, you making that up. No, I'm not. It's right here in the parable. It's right here in the scripture. Look at the very first thing that Jesus said. He said that the young man said to his father, Father, give me. You don't ask folk for stuff that you know they ain't got. You don't ask somebody who has no, you can ask Reverend Belton for a million dollars, but 
you know what you're going to need after we finish talking? You still going to need a million dollars because Reverend Dobson don't have it to give. You don't ask folk for stuff that they don't have. He went to his father and said, give me because he knew that he got it. How, how would this young man know what his father has? Number one, his father was generous. He said, give me the portion of goods that fall into me. Not only have you been successful in business, Father, not only have you been successful in your dealings with other folk, but you have been so successful till we got a trust fund, until we got bank accounts, and we got saving accounts, and you got some investments, and you want some land. Daddy, woo! I see it. You can't hide it. Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So the first way that we know that there was divine providence at the Father's house is because there is abundance at the Father's house. So much so that the young man feels comfortable in saying, Daddy, you can give me what I was going to give when you back anyway, and you're going to still be all right. Give me. Right now, give it to me. So Daddy was blessed with abundance. The second thing, there was godly leadership and godly principles at Daddy's house. Preacher, you making that up? Let me show it to you. The young man wanted all of these things from his father, not so that he could help his father while he stayed at home. He said, give it to me so I can leave. What do you mean, brother preacher? He wanted to leave so he could live a particular lifestyle that daddy and mama did not accept at the house. Godly leadership in principles. He said, I can't live a riotous, wasteful, sinful lifestyle here because daddy ain't going to have it. But I do know what I can't do. If I get my portion, I can go leave and leave on my own. That's good news for us parents. That's encouragement for us parents. Parents, live in your home like you expect your children to live when they need it. The reason why we've got hell in our streets, the, the reason why we just tied the murder rate from last year with a month still left to go in this year is because we don't have enough parents that are doing what Proverbs said. We need to chain up a child. in the way that they should go. Now listen, there's coming a time when your child reaches adulthood. And I tell you what my mama told me. You can live like you want to bust hell wide open if you want to, but you will not do it here. We got to train our children up in the way that they should go. That don't mean your child will be perfect. Because none of us in here are perfect. But the expectation is that we press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. So there was godly instruction and godly discipline at home. And he knew that if I want to cut loose and do my thing, I can't do it in daddy's house. The last thing that he missed at home was he did not appreciate his father's love. Show it to me right now. Here you go. Only godly love will allow let me, let me rephrase. Only God in love will restrain me in my house that I allow my children to live in for free. <laughs> Only God in love will restrain me when they demand something. 
from me what they did not earn or help me to make. Only godly love will restrain me when you demand that so that you can waste it on something that I know you do not need. And only godly love will keep me from putting my hands all over you when I give it to you and you don't even say thank you. Right 
right here and disconnect yourself spiritually from the Father and be in a far off country. How do you know? Because the songwriter said, if I had the wings of a dove, wings that would take me where I want to go, I'd fly to the utmost. You're not going to help me preach way out into the space. Then if somebody else said, no, 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 there's no hiding place. He said, what about if I cover my head? Somebody else said, no, 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 your feet will still be showing. He said, what if I cover my feet? They said, no, your head will show. He said, what, what if I make my bed in heaven? He said, no, no, he'll find you there. What if I make my bed in hell? He said, no, 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 he'll find you there. The songwriter said, what if I surmise that there must be no place? No hiding place from the presence of God. Now you can disconnect spiritually from God by not studying on a regular basis. You can begin to disconnect and take yourself spiritually to a far off country by not having an active prayer life. You can disconnect by doing things that you know are not godly. But can I tell you again, there's no physical place on heaven, under heaven, on the earth, under the earth, where you can get away from the presence of God. So the Bible said that he took a trip to a far off country. And yes, he did physically. But it was more about his spiritual outlook than it was his physical outlook. And can I give you one last point about Naomi Maker? And then that's the end of sheet two, and we almost done. The last point about this young man is that once he disconnected himself from godly parenting, then he disconnected himself from studying God's word, there's only one direction that you can take. Don't believe me? Look right at the scripture. It said that he got it all, took his journey, got to his far country. Then, said that he wasted his possession. All of the fine robes that he had packed in the trunks, all of the jewelry that were neatly stored in their cases to travel, all, all of the livestock that his daddy sent with him, all of the money, the cash money that he liked to flash in the nightclub. I know I ain't been the only one there. I can tell the truth about me. There was a time when I thought that the hottest thing going was to go into the club with a pocket full of money. Until I got in there and I said, this is what y'all are excited about? I can't hear nobody. The music is terrible. The drinks are overpriced. This is what y'all are excited about? Bible said he had spent all. And this, this is what I like about this parable. Said that he began to be in want. But before he began to be in want, I don't want to jump ahead. Because this is the part that kept shouting me when I was at home. said, and when brothers and sisters we serve a God that moves works and shows up to show out right in the middle of and when If you think I'm lying, I'll show it to you. We almost done. The 
four scriptures says, and when he had spent all, there arose a great famine. Notice the providence and power of God, he held back the famine. There was no famine when the young man was making these grand plans to head out. He might have stayed at daddy's house. There, there, there was no famine when he initially got out on the road. He might have turned around and went back to daddy's house. Now, there was not even a famine when he first got to party country. The famine was held back. Let, let me help somebody. I've discovered just in my life, I'm, I'm not talking about you. I know you was born perfect. You've been walking above the ground. You've been floating since the time that you learned how to walk because you've just been that holy. But there was a time when I sought out to do wrong and when I got myself into trouble, it always seemed like as soon as I spent the last dime I had on something that I know I did not need, that's when trouble hit. And if we were to be honest today, that's why some of us turn into the church to get our bills paid. It's not because we don't make enough at our job. You may not make everything you want, but you budget in for your good time, you budget in for the new clothes, you budget in for that cable bill, you budget in for everything except, oh, I forgot I had to pay the water bill. I knew I wasn't going to get too many amens right there, but I'm going to tell you, it's the truth. And so it just so happened that God held the famine back until he had spent his last. But I told you we serve an end window. God moves, God shows up, and shows out right in the middle of and win. And I know you don't believe me, so let me give you a couple of examples. And when Moses' hands went down, the children of Israel began to lose the battle. But when, when Aaron and her would steady up Moses' hands, the Bible declared that the children of Israel discomfited the Amalekites. And when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been bound up and tossed in the fire and furnace. The king said, now look in there, they ought to be burnt up by now. And the guard went over and when he looked in, he said, not only are they not consumed, but Yeah. 
to move in this young man's life. And I got to get out of here now. But uh, as we look down at the rest of the scripture, said that uh, he spent all the good time had ended. And uh, nobody was there to help feed him. Said that he went and joined himself to a citizen of the country. And uh, the citizen put him out in the field. Said, uh, you can feed the hogs. And uh, I don't know if you read your Bible, but for a young Jewish boy who did not eat swine, uh, it was considered uh, to be beneath him to even feed or touch him. And no, uh, the word said that out in the pig pee. This young rich man would have filled his belly with the same slop that uh, the hogs didn't eat. But can I tell you, young folk, I don't care how much you try, ain't no sustenance down in the hog pit. Give it to you again. There's no nutritional value in sin. This young man had disjoined himself from God's providence. Then he had disjoined himself from God's communication. And now uh, he's living out in a foreign country both in physicality and spirituality. And uh, the wages of sin Yeah. <laughs> 
that I will in this far off country. But can I tell you that this whole parable was an example to the Pharisees and the Sadducees as they were standing there judging Jesus for mingling with those sinners. He was teaching them that God rejoices every time one comes back to God in heaven rejoices every time the prodigal son returns. God in heaven rejoices every time that the lost coin is found. The lost coin is you and I. The prodigal son is you and I. The lost sheep is you and I. And God is rejoicing. standing out on the balcony. Didn't say what time the young man set off for daddy's house. Just said that when it came to itself, he didn't waste any time. Scripture said he left straight from that pit and uh, headed up the road to his daddy's house. He never stopped. His shoes were ragged. His clothes were dirty. And uh, said that his father was standing on the balcony. Didn't say whether he had just finished his morning meditation. Didn't say uh, whether he was in noonday prayer. Just said uh, that daddy was looking out and waiting on his son to come home. I don't know if that should fit anybody this morning. I'm trying to tell you and get over to you that don't matter what you've done. Don't matter how bad it seems to you. The Heavenly Father is standing out uh, and he's looking out and waiting on you to come home. Bible said that, that as the father saw his son off in the distance, said that before he ever heard his son voice, he started screaming to the servants, get my son a robe, get my son some shoes, get my son a ring. What is the symbolization of him dressing his son before his son walked back into his house? His father wanted him to understand that you are not going to look like what it is that you've been through. When you come back into my house, you are going to look like you've never left. That's the restorative power of God. Somebody in here right now has been through hell and high water, and you was looking forward to the high water. But if we looked at you right now, you look like a million bucks. We couldn't tell that something ever happened. And that's the same way that God is waiting to do to everybody. So he says, come on home.
doesn't matter. God is calling you home. So what they hurt you? God will heal you. So what they talked about you? God will silence every evil thing. Does not matter. The circumstances that caused you to run away, hear me and hear me now. God says, come home. The doors of the church are open. Whether you be here, whether you be under the sound of my voice, God is calling you to come home. And don't misunderstand me. Whether it's this body, whether it's another church, God is calling you back into fellowship. That's where he's calling you. We want you here at 1060 West 30th Street. We want you here. But if you feel led by the Spirit to move elsewhere, then go, but go and get active. Don't let it discourage you. In the text, it said that the older brother got angry at the celebration for the younger brother. And he didn't want to go in. That's not the kind of church that we are. Come home and watch the celebration. And guess what? If nobody else celebrates, you celebrate. You celebrate for what God has done. You celebrate for how God has kept you. Doors of the church open. And as this choir comes back, if you want to connect, you just want to stop backsliding. Call this number 601-600-7622. You can text that number. And if you just want to say, I want to give my life to Christ, text out. If you actually want to be a part of this body, text connect. Or if you just want to pray, text prayer and we'll pray. Again, that's 601-600-7622. God says to come home. He's waiting with open arms. And he's ready, willing, and able to restore you. After the choir comes, come on home. As renewed faith comes back to us. Come on home.
Matthew. It is prayer time, and I'm going to read off today's prayer list, but before I do, I do want to make one quick announcement that the funeral for Brother William Smith III will be held Friday, December the 3rd at 11.30 a.m. here at Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church. Again, the funeral for Brother William Smith will be held Friday, December 3rd at 11.30 a.m. here at Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. What a message, what a message. What a wonderful message to lead us into prayer on this morning and when. So as we consider our names on the prayer list, remember that we serve an and when God. Amen? Thank you, Reverend. The prayer list reads as such. Sister Diane Sharpshire, Sister Sharon Felder, Sister Angela Adams, Sister Deshay Belton, Sister Mary Moe. Amen. Those are the names on the prayer list for this morning. You know what you have need of. So if you would please stand at your seats. Let us go to the Lord on one accord. Amen. It's so good to know that God is an and when and on time God with bowed heads and humble hearts. Eternal God, our Father, it is in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, that we come before you today. Father, we thank you for all that you have done and all that you are doing. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the preached word that has prepared our hearts now for prayer. So that, Lord God, those things that we have been wrestling with, Lord, we understand and know that you hear and answer prayer. And that you are working in all things for our good. Father, we're asking in the name of Jesus that you would bless each and every name that has been called out on the prayer list today. And Heavenly Father, we're also asking, Lord God, that you would bless and touch those unspoken prayers that are among us today, whether they be online or right here in the sanctuary. Lord God, you know our needs and our concerns even before we pray them. And there may be those times, Heavenly Father, when we pray that our prayers are not answered exactly the way that we pray them, but we know you hear our prayer and you do answer prayer. So help us to understand that, Lord God, when we pray and when you answer the prayer, that you have heard our prayer and you are working in all things for our good and even for the good of those who we pray for.
so, so many of you were so, so very generous in your time and in your, uh, just the, the way that you loved us. There was more food at the house than we could eat. Folk called, there were cars. And so while it seems very hollow and not enough, we just want to say thank you so much. The, those two words seem to not be able to do it justice for everything that was done for us, but for the bottom of our hearts. Pilgrim family, Deshae and I love you, and we thank you so very much for your prayers. We thank you so very much for the food that was made, for all of the help that was given, and we just want to say thank you. That's the reason why I came back, and then we want to uh, take up the offering, and we're going to pray over our tithes and offering very quickly. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that our eyes and Years have heard. Uh, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless those who have to give, those who do not have to give. Heavenly Father, and we ask that the money that was taken up here today in tithes and offerings, whether it be for the book scholarship, whatever it's for, Heavenly Father, we ask that it would be used in ministry to further your kingdom. Now may the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest full and abide with you now, henceforth, and forever. And every heart said, Amen. 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 Now take up the offer. 